I was really excited um, when, you know, I heard your name brought up with um, Little Fish at Counting because we were doing a podcast and, uh, you know, she was describing her journey to entrepreneurship. She was just saying this book transformed her life. And we're like, well, what book was that? Like, what, what book did you read that made you completely <laughs> flip, you know, upside down what you were working on? And she said, the company of one. And I said, well, what is this? And so she described it and she, her entire, her entire scenario, her entire vibe, her face, her body language transformed into like this blossoming entity. And I thought, wow, I need to get that book. Wow. You know, I mean, seriously. So I was really, you know, really excited about that conversation. And then, you know, coincidentally, as uh, we were doing our, you know, our editing process with our, um, with our editor, yeah. and his name is Chris. Yeah, Chris. And he said, you know, I actually know Paul Jarvis. We're like, okay, great. He's like, would you <laughs> like to meet Paul Jarvis? We're like, sure. He's like, you should actually interview him on your podcast. I'm like, let's do it. Boys and girls gathered around to wake goodbye to Annie Mae. Mama cried and cried. Dad ignored her too. Annie Mae. Find your way. I'm Ginger Birkenbuehl. And I'm Esther Ikoro. And we're the hosts of the Honest Field Guide podcast. Entrepreneurship is no joke. The journey is full of anticipation, failure, hope, and disappointment. You'll make money and be totally broke at the same time. The Honest Field Guide podcast tells you the truth. We know being an entrepreneur is crazy hard and you will sometimes cry at dinner. Listen in to be inspired, laugh, and learn how to really thrive on your business journey. I don't like the phrase jack of all trades, master of none. I prefer master of all trades. You know, that's kind of how I feel like I just would describe you. Paul Jarvis is a writer and designer who's had his own company of one for the last two decades. His latest book, Company of One, explores why bigger isn't always better in business. It's been translated into 16 languages. He's worked with professional athletes like Steve Nash and Shaquille O'Neal, corporate giants like Microsoft and Mercedes-Benz, and entrepreneurs with online empires like Danielle Laporte and Marie Florio. Currently, he teaches popular online courses, hosts several podcasts, and develops small but mighty software solutions. I was thinking to myself, wow, the transformation that has taken place with this author, he is moved to a remote place in the, you know, in, in, on the continent, mm -hmm. left a very busy existence. And I can understand as I was driving why you did it. You just kind of calm down. Like once you get onto the island, it feels calmer. Once you get out of the city, it feels calmer. It's just nice. Mm -hmm. yeah, I like it. Mm -hmm. Cause I lived downtown, uh, Vancouver for 10 years. I lived on the main street. Like there was literally a billboard, a video billboard outside of our master bedroom flashing 24 seven. And that sounds horrible. A hundred percent. It was awful. And we don't have that here, which is really, really nice. So yeah, I'm glad that I can do a job where I don't have to be in a specific place to, to do the work that I do. So yeah, I'm grateful for that. Mm hmm. So this concept that kind of brought you out here, this idea of a company of one, how do you describe it to people as your elevator pitch? Mostly the thesis of the book is that not all growth is good or beneficial. So it's our job to question growth. Mm -hmm. So sometimes growth is good. Like When you start a business, for example, you will have no clients, no revenue, no anything, right? So you have to go from zero to something. And in that case, growth is good. But then there can come a point where growth might not be what is best for you as an owner or what is best for you as a business or even what is best for your customers. So I, the point of the book is just um, yeah, to, to question growth because it makes sense completely sometimes. And if we don't challenge it, we'll always just assume that growth is always good and that's a bad thing. So when you were deciding that you wanted to move into the, to the woods, you know, designing your life what are some of the things that you said for yourself that defined success freedom is is the main thing right like i work for myself not because it's easier 
because it's not, but because I want the freedom to say, okay, I want to work with this person or I don't want to work with this person or this company's values don't align with mine. So maybe I don't want to work with them. I want to work with somebody else. Or I want to sell this type of product versus this type of product. Or I want to not work for four months and not have to ask for two weeks vacation kind of thing. So for me, it's freedom, it's choice, it's being able to say, if this is the type of business that I want and these are the type of people that I want to serve, then how can I best do that? And so when you, when you were leaving in your van, you know, with your wife, was that a time of deep reflection too, when you were thinking, this is where we're going to start making a change or what was the process around you deciding we're out of here? It was mostly just anger and frustration and just like, okay, we've had enough. The deep reflection came after because when you move to the middle of nowhere and you remove all of that stimulus, you're just left with your own thoughts, which is scary, very scary. So yeah, the deep reflection came after that because there was, we removed almost all the stimulus. Like we didn't have any, like we didn't have a social group out here. Like we just kind of up and left. And then in dealing with it was just, okay, well, there's a lot uh, to think about <laughs> now. So when you said you were hearing your thoughts, was that the first time you'd heard your thoughts and your wife too? Yeah, I think so. Like we had, we'd been coming to the Island every, most weekend. That was the other thing. Like we realized every moment we got uh, free, we would escape the city. And we were like, why do we keep coming back? If all we want to do is escape, why do we keep returning? And yeah, when we left, it was, yeah, it was probably the first time because there was so much going on all the time in the city and there's none of that out here. There's not even, you pass the one store that this area has. You drove past it. I think I missed it. What was it? You probably blinked. Yeah, you blinked. What was it? What's it called? Because we're going to hit it on the way back because Esther and I, when we were driving past the store, I was looking at the store and she was looking at the notes. (laughs) So that's why you missed it. But what is it called? I don't think... I don't even think it has, I'm it, not sure it has a name. Everybody just calls it Dave's because the guy who owns it is called Dave. <laughs> nice. It's just Dave's store. So I, I love that you brought up your thoughts because I've actually been spending a lot of time thinking about my thoughts recently and thinking about them Deep. in the context of, you know, my business and mm-hmm. my relationships. When you were hearing your thoughts for the first time, especially because I don't, I don't know at that point if you were an entrepreneur or not, and I do want to ask that later, yeah. but were your thoughts scary and, 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 you know, what was happening when you were hearing your thoughts? Yeah, very scary. I think it's kind of the issue that people have when they first encounter like meditation, like it's really hard to just sit with yourself, like really, really hard to do that because I think a lot of us spend so much time trying to push that out or dull it out or fill our lives with anything other than our own thoughts right like from stand like we can't just stand in line anymore we have to be standing in line like flipping on instagram or something like that or listening to a podcast when you go for a run like every single second of every single day we feel like we have to fill if something happens on the internet i don't know unless i log into twitter i don't know if i have an email unless i log into email and in doing that i'm not distracted every couple minutes or every couple seconds i guess I can just kind of sit down and get to work. And what I find is it's hard for the first couple minutes and then it gets easier. And then you just kind of like get in the zone and then you just kind of like time kind of goes away and you're just able to focus and get things done. And then if I want to do email, then all I'm doing is focusing on email. If I want to do Twitter, all I'm doing is focusing on Twitter. And in doing it kind of sequentially, instead of trying to say, I'm just going to do all of the things all at the same time, Things just happen faster, I think. So when you came out here with your wife, and I just want to go back to this because this to me is getting to the one of the questions I want to ask you about when you decided to become Paul Jarvis, right? When you were driving here with your with your wife and it was, you know, it was a drive of frustration and relief was coming, you think, but it was frustration. You know, when you got here and you landed, how long did it take for the two of you? And I, I don't know if it was a joint venture or if it was an individual process for you, but how long did it take before you calmed down and started having time to actually think? 
Yeah, that's a good question. It was probably six months to a year, I think. It took it took some time. It took a lot of going to yoga and surfing every single day before work. <laughs> Those two things really help slow the mind down. So I think that in conjunction with living in the middle of nowhere, it was a process. It wasn't just like... Oh my God, we're on the island now. It's calm. I mean, that does happen. Like when you get off the ferry, it's a totally different vibe than when you're getting on the ferry kind of thing. We feel every time we go to the mainland or go to Washington state, we feel that where as soon as we land here, it's like, it's like a bit of a sigh of relief. So there is that, but to like fully, to fully get to, to where we got to, it took, yeah, it took months. And in that process, did you have fear? Yes. A lot or yes, a little? Yes, all of it. What was the fear? Uh, that I couldn't unwind. I, I still have that fear a little bit because it's not like it goes away completely. Um, yeah, that if we were making a mistake because all of our friends were in Vancouver, I do work remote. I've worked remote for 20 years, but I did have, like I made a lot of connections in Vancouver because I moved there and lived there right when tech was starting in that city. And so I was pretty well connected and it's like, okay, well now I'm going to be like six, seven hours away from that. Like, are people going to remember me (laughs) to like work together kind of thing? So yeah, I mean, those fears were definitely there and they've kind of gone away a little bit, but they're still there a bit. How? I don't know. I mean, are you, you know, because fear (laughs) is, is a real thing, especially when you're an entrepreneur. So how do you... How have you overcome that fear? Because you said it, it, it took six months or more to calm down. Mm-hmm. And then it took time within that process to not be afraid, but you still were. And sometimes it still rears its ugly head to you. Yeah. So what is your process to, you know, get rid of it? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a proportionate fear and disproportionate fear. So like if I'm swimming with sharks, I'm going to be afraid and I should be. Makes sense. But I also think that fear um, can be a bit of a driver as well. Like if I'm afraid that, I don't know, like if I'm afraid that my business isn't going to make it, like if I'm just starting out, for example, then it might push me to, to do the work to make it happen instead of just wishing it happens. I think that fear can go away with action as well. So if I'm afraid to do something, the second I start to do it, I have a bit less fear. When I accomplish that thing, then I have less fear. So the fear can drive me to, okay, if I just start this thing, I'm going to feel a bit better. So let's do that. Or I, if I finish this thing, then I'm just going to, I'm going to feel a bit better. So let's push to there. I mean, that can get a little unhealthy as well, but I do think that that can be a bit of a motivator for sure for me where it's like, well, I want to do well. I don't need to do, like, I don't need to be Mark Zuckerberg or something. But, like, I do I do want to do well. I want to provide for my family. And so I like to, yeah, push myself forward and do things like write books, make software, all the things that I do. And that makes me feel a bit better, right? So, yeah, I think having that fear, as long as it's not, like, your heart rate is 120 from like wake up to go to bed. It's probably not healthy and that needs to be dealt with, but just a little bit of underlying fear I think can be a bit motivating. That's interesting. So when you decided to go all in on this idea of a company of one, what were some of the biggest objectives that you heard from people when you were trying to explain the concept to them? Because seeing the, outcome i'm like well yeah duh <laughs> like this this place looks great this is sweet uh you you've got it running like a well-oiled machine and you've got your rhythm you've caught your stride but i can also understand from the perspective of the person who's still plugged into the machine so to speak all of the different objections but what are what are some of the patterns that you hear in objections yeah i mean i think we've all heard the oh if you're not growing you're dying kind of thing The paradigm in business is that where growth is seen as always good and you have to 10x the things that you're supposed to 10x. And I think that's a remnant of industrialization where you needed 
more to do better. You needed to have a bigger factory to make more widgets to drive the cost down so your margins could go up. Like that makes perfect sense. So you need growth, you need scale, you need all of those things. I think where we're at now, I would question that that is necessary for a lot of businesses, especially digital businesses. I I don't need more employees to sell more courses. I don't need more um, or to sell more software kind of thing. Even the friends that I have that do some physical products that just have partnerships with different manufacturers in the States where they can be like a three person business and do seven, eight figures. And I think this is the way the business used to work before industrialization as well, where it was just a group of small businesses all working together at different parts of the supply chain where they could get things done in the least extractive way possible. Whereas capitalism now is the most extractive thing possible. There's a couple shareholders at the top that are trying to extract as much from their workers, from their customers, from profits that regular people don't see any of that money. It just creates like a a disparity in wealth. The idea of company of one kind of pushes against that paradigm, but I also see it kind of working in parallel with other things that are happening right now, like with the environmental movement. Like we can't have unlimited growth where resources are extracted because we have a finite number of resources. So it makes sense that we don't try to grow things like we don't try to extract all of the oil right this second. Like that doesn't make any sense. Maybe we could leave some of it in the ground. So I think that people are starting to see that. I think people are as well starting to challenge the idea of what success is for them personally. So I wouldn't want to be the head of a huge company. I don't like managing people. I'm not even good at managing people. So why would I want to fill my day with managing people if I had a big company? Or why would I want to basically promote myself out of a job I like, which is writing, designing, that sort of thing, into a job of management if I hired 8, 9, 10, 200 people? So I think if we question that and we see some people do want to be managers, some people do want to have that thing that they can build and manage and that I don't have a problem with that I just think we should think about it for ourselves for me I like just kind of doing my own thing in my home office and getting work done that way and working with people remotely but that's not I know that's not for everyone a family of misfits second class outcasts city dwelling loners it's not the same without any When I first read your book, the whole premise is, you know, fight the power, pretty much, you know, fight the power. Um, Do not think that you have to be big. My entire career has been spent trying to make it look like I'm bigger or try to get bigger or definitely get bigger or get bigger clients or get big, big, big. And I even had a client say to me, if you don't grow, you're going to shrink and you will go out of business. And I, I'm trying to unpack it. I mean, even as I'm reading your book and I'm inspired and I'm, I'm, I'm blown away and I'm, I'm feeling passionate about this. And, you know, my, my uh, colleague, uh, Little Fish Accounting, said, you know, your book transformed her life. You know, can you tell me how I can stop <laughs> believing this? Because even though I read your book and I do believe it, it's like I have this force that's like, no, Ginger, no, you got to still grow. Otherwise, people won't take you seriously. Yeah. I mean, we all have that fear of, well, I'm not a legitimate entrepreneur unless I have staff or unless I have offices. And it kind of doesn't end. Like once you have offices, it's like, well, I'm not a legitimate entrepreneur unless I have multiple offices or multiple offices in other countries. How do you want to spend your days is my question to you. Okay. I'm so glad you asked that. That's What would make you the happiest if you were spending your days? And it it can be work, right? We're talking about work. So Mm -hmm. in terms of work, how would you most like to spend your days? I would like to spend most of my days not spending more than 12 hours a day at work, whatever that work looks like. That's and a lot that of hours. and that 12 hours having it be jam packed full of all the things between managing clients and social media and um controlling conversations you know handling paperwork staff you know all kinds of things i mean 12 hours a day and of course there's also family commitments too so then you have more time after that 12 hours to do your thing so i think if there is a way 
to not spend that much time is the first place. And then the second mm-hmm. place would be, and this is the part that resonated the most when I was reading your book, um, Company of One, being able to have the freedom of having the clients that I know align with my values and then finding a way to target those clients all the time. So I'm not fishing, which I, I love the cover of your book. <laughs> There's fish. I don't yes. know if you, you know, fishing for the right clients. And also I want the right clients to find me. Like mm-hmm. I want them to find my company and say, oh my gosh, this is a really perfect match. And so the clients I do have at the agency, most of them are perfect matches. Mm-hmm. And I would say within the last year, I've started saying no more, but not with the confidence and joy to vive that you've been able to do with Takes, yourself. Yeah. And I'm, I'm working on that. So that was a little bit of a longer answer, but that's kind of the space that I'm in right now. Yeah. I mean, it does sound like you're on the right path if you are starting to say no. Like, I mean, as you do more work and you find the work that lights you up the most, then you can start to say no to work that isn't like that. And then you build up a reputation for yourself in that one little niche. That's what a lot of entrepreneurs kind of get stuck in is they're like, well, and it's hard too, right? Like if somebody's like, oh, I want to hire you, they're offering you money, right? And in the beginning, it's like, say yes to all of the clients, like say yes to all the work, build your portfolio, build your reputation. But I think as you go on and you start to see like, okay, this is the type of work that I like to do the most. These are the type of people that I can help the most. These are the type of people that have the money to pay me the most at the top of my industry kind of thing. Then you can start to say no first with a little bit of trepidation and then with more and more confidence as, as you do that and build up a name for yourself. And then you're only competing with yourself instead of competing with like, all of the writers on Google, like if somebody's searching, like I need a writer for this, or I need a designer, a programmer, they know because they talk, people in an industry talk to each other, like any, any industry that's big enough to have a conference, all of those people from all of those companies get together and talk, right? In the beginning, I was working primarily with pro athletes and they have agents. Their agents talk to other agents in the company that companies talk to other companies. So in doing a few of those websites, it led me to get more and more and more. And then I realized how much sports agents are awful people. They have to be so that the athletes aren't assholes, basically. And I realized I didn't want to do that kind of work. And I guess after that, I kind of moved more into like the digital entrepreneur space. I saw that as like really taking off. There's a lot of women in that space who are doing amazing things and they were willing to take risks and try fun and interesting ideas on projects. And I was like, these are the people that I need to work with. And these were Danielle and Marie you're referring to? Marie, Danielle, Chris Carr, Alexander Franz, and those types of women who were willing to take fun and exciting and interesting risks. And I was like, these are the type of people instead of doing at the, I guess just before that I was doing a lot of corporate work and corporate work is boring. It can pay well, sure. But it, if you do that for, I probably did that for about 10 years, it gets a little boring. And then I saw these women doing like more edgy stuff, more interesting stuff, taking more risks, willing to be themselves in, in their brands and that. And this was all a new thing. This is probably 12, 15 years ago. So it was before. Now it's kind of commonplace that everybody has like a strong, authentic brand or whatever. But at the time it was like, this is different. Like this is, this is some pretty awesome stuff. And like, I, I need to be a part of this cause this is something that like makes me excited to like get to work and work on these projects. You know, I have a funny story to tell you because it just reminded me. So when I first started helping another client launch her brand, um, she pulled samples of people that were on the internet monetizing their coaching processes. And so I started researching people to try to find examples to help this woman launch her own company, which is called Mindhearted. And, you know, she was way ahead of the time, around the time of the other women. Um, She just didn't have a formal sort of realized experience for what she was creating in her head. So I did help her launch. And I remember coming across Danielle Laporte And I was like, oh my gosh, I actually love this website design. Who did this website design? It's great. And it was you. It was. And I saw it. (laughs) And I remember, and it's so funny because, um, you know, I forgot about this time of my life. So before we came here, I just did a search on my email. And 
I found out that I signed up for your email list in 2013. Oh, wow. Based on a <laughs> website that you did. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe I'm going to meet the guy that I loved the website he designed when I was doing research for my own clients. So even then, I remember looking at your work and seeing the simplicity and clarity of it and the streamlined sort of thinking yeah. um, around it. And so I kind of feel like you've been on this path for a while. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, with this sort of simplicity, when did this become, you know, a brand or is it a brand? Is, is Paul Jarvis a brand or is Paul Jarvis a person or is it a company? Because you've been on this path for a while. Yes. I think it's all of those things, sort of. I mean, even when I started, I was looking at my this way back machines, a fun tool on the internet, especially for somebody who's been on the internet for as long as I have. Even my original sites were just very clean and simple. This was at a time when there was dating myself, but there was like a lot of flash and a lot of fancy things happening on the screens at all times. And there was like myself, 37 signals when they were doing design and not base camp. They did web design. 37, too. 37 signals. Right. <clears throat> yeah. So they had, they were very simple. I was very simple. There's like a couple other people who are very simple. I was looking at the progression on way back machine of my, of my site, and it's barely changed. It's been simple since the nineties. And I guess I never grew out of that. And I always found clients who were interested in that. That was something Danielle was super on board with. She just like really simple, clean. And that really spoke to the things that she was offering really well. And it helped kind of convey her message really well. And a bunch of other clients similar. So that's kind of always been, yeah, how I've operated is simple, minimal. And I don't want to, I want to say that you said a minute ago, back then it was innovative, which it was, because I remember when my, when my client showed me this, I thought, there's people making money at this? Are you joking me? But you said that now everybody's doing it, you know, that it's, everybody's got an authentic brand. Do you really think everyone has an authentic brand? That, that kind of slipped off your mouth a little yeah. too fast for me. Yeah, you're right. I don't think everybody does. I, do. I think that's not, I think people some people are more willing to show their authentic selves it doesn't mean that everybody is doing that and there's definitely people who like the people that rent private jets so they can take insta stories and that's not authentic at all this bullshit it's smoke and mirrors 100 smoke and mirrors or they rent an airbnb so they can shoot a video that shows up on every fucking you sorry i don't know if i can swear every youtube ad before you want to watch a video on something important it's like some guy walking through a house and it's like you can make money drop shipping too look at my house i have to give it back in an hour that's, <laughs> like that's, that's not so, authentic yeah. at all uh, the idea of authenticity is really interesting to me because it's an active process and oftentimes just in the same way that people so easily slipped into you get a job here you do this this is how it works people are also slipping into the wanting to put themselves through the entrepreneur authentic personal brand machine mm -hmm. and when we talk to small business owners all the time and they're like well how do i i'm like well you have to figure out what it is for you because if you, there's no cookie cutter branding process and storytelling it, it's a real thing but it's an overused phrase i gotta find a different yeah. phrase but you know building a narrative around your product who you are your company culture all of that stuff people want to grind that through a machine how do you maintain that compass in yourself and if you do some sort of brand strategy work or mentoring or coaching around that for other entrepreneurs how do you maintain that um compass yeah, I think it's hard because I think we see, and if it was only that easy um, to just have a cookie cutter to mm -hmm. be able to do that, we see examples in other people who are doing well. And we think that the reason they're doing well is because they are like over the top or something. Like, what's that guy's name? Grant Cardone. Yeah, Grant Cardone. Yeah, like the world doesn't need two of that guy. Right. But you see that and you see that he has a private jet and 15 houses and he 10Xs all of his 10Xs. And you see that and you're like, okay, well, I have to be that kind of personality to get there. Or even with somebody like Marie Forleo, like she's very, out, she's very nice person. She's very outspoken. She is very good at dancing and that same with like Ellen. I'm not that person. Like I'm not going to dance. I'm very introverted. I'm not a 
out there kind of personality, but I would rather succeed or fail for who I am than succeed or fail trying to be somebody else. Cause then in the back of my head, I'll be like, what if I was just like me? Mm-hmm. And like, I even think about like the way that I communicate with my audience. It's like, I'm going to share like authentically me with them because if it's good or bad or whatever, they're still going to get to know me. They're still going to have that as like the differentiator because like, this is a business book. There's, I don't know, a million business books on Amazon. What's going to make somebody want to buy this book versus another book? And it's the fact that it's me telling the story or somebody else telling that story. And I think it would, the world would be a very boring place if everybody acted the same way or like sold in the same way. And I think that that would be just a boring homogenous nightmare of everybody being like it it wouldn't be interesting that business would cease to be interesting for myself and for I think most people and so I think the fact that people have different voices different experiences different lenses through which they see things that's what makes everything interesting so I think that's yeah Mm -hmm. permission to just do that did you grow up around entrepreneurship people zero zero people my dad had his job probably 40 or 50 years before he retired. What about your mom? She was a homemaker until we were teenagers and then worked in the charity space. But before she started working in that space, she didn't know that she wanted to do that. And it was for a math. It's like for one of the biggest charities in the world. So it was definitely not very small and scrappy. Yeah. Nobody in my life growing up uh, worked for themselves. Wow. So so you're kind of a pioneer in the sense that you're breaking that mold. What did your family think when you're like, I'm leaving the corporate machine and I think I'm going to go figure it out on my own? Yeah. I mean, mean, did you even have that conversation? I mean, did you actually tell your parents? Because I think that some people don't have a conversation. They just do what they're doing. And other people actually have to sit down and have a conversation and, and almost ask permission or be released. It kind of helped because I dropped out of university to take a job that was paying more than I thought I was going to make after I got my degree. And so that, I think, really softened the blow with my parents because they were like, okay, you're making really good money, so I can't really complain. The dean of the program was pissed off, and he's like, you're going to be back, and you're going to be older, and it's going to be harder for you to learn. I'm like, let's just see what happens. How old were you when he said that to you? I was like 18 or 19. You're going to be too old to learn. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to have to come back and do, cause I was doing comp sci and artificial intelligence. He's like, you're going to quit. You're going to regret it. You're going to have to come back and you're going to be that much older than everybody else in the program. I'm like, all right, dude, like let's, I don't think I called him dude, but like, I'm like, let's just see. I don't know what's going to happen. So. So I just want to back up a little bit because one of the things that we always realize is that some people slowly evolve to entrepreneurship and some people become right right away. So yes. I didn't evolve. Yeah. I literally left the corporate space intentionally and I started my own company and never looked back. Yeah. Right. So and other people fall into it. I'm wondering was there ever a time that you thought you were going to go back to corporate or was there a light bulb moment? Was there some place of like, I hit it. Here I am. I'm an author. I've got a book and this is what my life is going to be like forever. I want that to happen. I want that to feel like, I want to wake <laughs> it hasn't up and happened feel yet? like, Get out. that would be awesome. <laughs> um, no, like I started my company, like I left the agency that I was working at. I was going to go find another job. And then the day that I left the agency, Uh, that I was working at, all the clients started calling me and saying like, well, where are you going to go? We'll just take our work with you because we like you more than the company. And I like the clients more than the company. So it kind of worked out. So I started my business kind of that day. But people have offered me jobs before. Even still? Not recently. I think the, the last time I was offered a job was 2011. It doesn't feel like a fit. Like it feels like I'm completely unemployable at this point, and I'm kind of happy about that. So. How to feel unemployable? I, I mean, feel I that just. Way. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I mean, here's the thing: when when you say that, you say you feel unemployable, 
but you have the confidence to keep moving forward. You have to know that there are so many people like you out there that can't do what you're doing. And that's the, yeah. that is sort of the space that you're in that many people aren't, which is why they stay in their corporate jobs. And a lot of people aren't able to make that leap that you made. Mm-hmm. And I don't even know what is the place that a person can find the leap. Yeah. I think it can start small for some people. Like a lot of my friends have started small, like evenings and weekends working on stuff. And I think that confidence can build over time. Confidence can build with repetition. It's just like you don't like pick up a tennis racket and you're Serena Williams, right? Like you need to hit the ball a lot of times to have the confidence to just smash it. And I think sometimes we can, like, I just kind of lucked into it and that I couldn't replicate those circumstances because it was a circumstance of basically luck for myself. But I think that you can start small and iteratively with, if you want to do something, the internet, like I even look at the way the internet worked 20 years ago versus now, like to sell something, to take somebody's credit card on the internet used to require a special bank account. And it was like, couple months of waiting to get a merchant account and a payment processor. Now you can sign up for Stripe or PayPal and start charging people money. You can make a thing and put it on Etsy. Like you can do so many things. You can sell a digital product on Gumroad and all you need to do is click upload and set a price for it. So I think that you can start small. And I think that a lot of times we can get in our own ways when we think that it needs to get huge quickly. Like, oh, if I'm not selling at this level, like I haven't made it. But like if you're making an extra like couple grand a year outside of your work, then how is that a bad thing? And like if it grows from that, then awesome. If it doesn't grow from that, then what's the problem making like some extra money for you and your family kind of thing? So I think that a lot of times entrepreneurs especially feel the pressure to get big or to like have a six figure launch or whatever. And it's like, those things don't happen all the time. And they also don't need to happen. Like if you made 90 K instead of a hundred K on a launch, would you really be sad? Like what world would it be like? Oh, I failed. I've only made $90,000. Right. So I think we set these expectations and sometimes we set them unrealistically high and we're just setting ourselves up to be disappointed when, if we just framed our mindset in a different way, it's like, shit, I just made like thousand dollars or I just made $90,000. Like, how was that not awesome? And I think if we frame it as like, look at me doing this thing, then who cares how big it is? We're just doing it. What were some of the ways that your company evolved from what you started doing to the many things that you're doing now? So for, for the listeners who don't know, can you just explain where what you were doing in the agency sure. world because you've talked about yeah. artificial intelligence i'm hearing a little bit about design we all know that you've written this book and you do software so and all these amazing women you've worked with I exactly mean. so how did those things start to reveal themselves as viable options to you and how did you decide which ones you were gonna yeah. turn your attention towards yeah so it's i did web design and digital consulting for probably 15 years like i did that that was the only thing like that was i was working for myself but that was my day job basically and then i realized once i'd worked with all of these women who were releasing these digital products i was like they're actually really smart. Like they can, they can make a thing and scale it without them having to scale. I'm like, that's a, that's a pretty good idea. So I wrote, I think, I think the first thing I did was write a book and it was just me. And it was during a time I'd like to do weird experiments with my life. So it was at a time when I was trying to buy nothing for a year. I think this was, this was like just after I'd moved um, to the island And so I wrote a cookbook and all of my plates and bowls and stuff aren't like, these aren't very nice. So like I can plate things really nice. So like I traded with a chef at a restaurant. I got my friend to edit the book and I traded her for some design. So I wrote my first book for $0 kind of evenings and weekends while I was doing my day job design. And then that made a bit of money. So I was like, okay, this, this makes sense. I'm going to write another book. And then that made a bit more money. And then I scaled back my design work. So it was just kind of like, as the products were making more and more money that I could scale the design work back. And that took 
probably about two and a half years to go from I am a web designer and that's my only job to I make products and that's my only job. So now it's courses, software, books, podcasts, I think. I don't know if I'm missing anything, but it was like, it was slow and gradual steps. And I kept seeing along the way. And there was a bunch of setbacks too. I would make a product that wouldn't sell. I'd be like, this isn't a viable product. Time to can this and work on something else. And then as I made products that did well, I was like, okay, I'm just going to keep working on these things because businesses need to make money. If the product is making money, then I'm going to keep going with it. If it's not, then I'm going to ditch it and try something else. How many products did you try that didn't work? I think I have about a 50% batting average. So 50% do some, make some form of revenue. And then 50%, yeah, they don't. Or they make so little that it doesn't really, it doesn't do enough to, to keep them going. You have the option to do so many different things. And sometimes when people step up to the plate for the first time and their first at bat doesn't work. It's like, oh, well, exactly. I got to go back and get a job or yeah. this isn't, I'm not cut out for this. So how did you deal with the emotions of initial disappointment Yeah, and decide I'm going to try something else? And how different was the first idea from the second thing that you tried? Yeah. I mean, it sucks when things don't work and that doesn't go away. Like if something didn't work right now, that would suck and set me back a little bit. But the point I think that I would make there is that I'm never going to take a risk that is going to ruin me or my business. So the first book I did for $0, so it didn't cost me anything to make my first product. The next product that I did was based on the revenue. I didn't want my web design to ever, I didn't want my day job to ever fund my products. So the first book made, I don't know, it was probably like 12 grand. And then I used that money to pay my editor so she could edit the book to make it better and pay for a few more things. And then as that book did well, I could use that money to, for something else. And I think that I never want to make a bet in my business, even now that has that where the worst possible thing that could happen is shit. I can't run my business anymore. So I'm okay to take risks as long as they are very, very small and incremental and I think that has worked really well for me where as I've been working as well, like I'm always putting money into savings. And so if the business has like a bad month or something, I've got some money set aside. And if you put that money in places that ha that make interest, like compound interest, then it, your money ends up making more money. So I think the smartest thing I did in my 20s was put money into index funds because I was like, okay, I don't know how to play the stock market. I still don't know how to play. I don't know if anybody does it well for very long. They can do it well for a little bit of time and then it blows up. But I think treating the business like this is something that I want to have that sustains me is really important because I think that we're only in control of so much with business, with life, with anything. So it's not fully under my control to say like, okay, I need to make like $5,000 next month. It's like, I can hope that I do and I can set myself up and I can have a brand and I can have a mailing list that buys stuff. But like, it might not happen. I don't have full control over that. It's just like when somebody says, I, wanna, I want my book to be a bestseller. There's so many moving pieces there that like, there's no way to guarantee that without spending a lot of money to buy yourself onto the bestseller list. I did want to talk about money because a lot of entrepreneurs don't talk about money at all. Um, there's two things I'm curious about. One, you mentioned sustainability, which is something that stops all of us from being entrepreneurs. We're just like, you know what? When I turn 65, am I going to be able to do this? What, what is this like? What? How am I going to do this at 65 years old? You know, what about health insurance? And of course, yeah. we're in Canada, so you yeah. don't have to worry about that. And we're American and that's what stops innovation in America right now is, is lack of health insurance. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are like not even going to do it because if something happens and they get sick, then they're basically, they're out of luck. And when it comes to money, um, you, found, you sound very confident about money, but you also sound intentional about money. Um, you know, you're not looking at social media and looking at how many likes you got, yeah. which is not paying you nothing, right? Exactly. I mean, so... Talk about the long-term space in the context of 
the fact that you're confident and comfortable thinking about money as you're working? Yeah. I mean, the only reason that I'm confident about money is because I live below my means. So mm. I don't spend more than I have. So I always have some money left. And I know that that's not always possible, especially when you're starting out, because if you're not making enough to sustain you, then you have to live above your means just by virtue of that's just the way that life is going. And I hope that that situation can change. But I teach a course on freelancing, um, the business of freelancing, and it's mostly Americans. And most of them say the same thing as you is health insurance kills my, yeah, I even have friends who were making good money freelancing and came down with some illnesses and had to get a job where they had health care. It's just like, I don't understand <laughs> how a first world country can operate like that. Like, I'm not even talking politics. I'm just talking like basic human rights. Like it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to me that that exists in a country that it doesn't need to. I know. I mean, Paul, we could spend the entire podcast talking about the healthcare system in the United States and how it kills innovation. Yeah, it does. Um, and it, it's it sad sure because America is such an innovative country and there is so much potential for innovation in the States. And so that makes me just pretty sad. And coupled with innovation with lots of money to be made, yeah, it's, it's like... These, these horrible forces that are battling each other and, and you know who's going to win right now are, you know, I don't know who's going to win, frankly. I'm not quite sure. Um, but when you think about the future and the sustaining part, how does a person that is deciding as they're listening to you or as my colleague, um, Little Fish, said, I'm going to change my life and I'm going to be a company of one, mm -hmm. how do you reconcile that with the, the, you know, turning 65 or 67 or 70 and still doing what you're doing and feel like you can do it when you're young and you're like, what? Is that going to still work for me? Yeah, I think it's like, I feel like a broken record, but it's small iterative steps, like putting a little bit of money, like when I wasn't making a ton of money, I was putting a little bit of money away in a savings because I've always assumed that my government isn't going to take care of me when I get old, even though I live in Canada. I'm still like, I don't know if you've got me here. I just, I don't trust it. Wow. Because that's just the way that it works is like if you can take care of yourself, then that is empowering. And so if you have the ability to do that and to even put like I was probably putting like 15, 20 bucks a month in a savings uh, in my early 20s. And then as I started to make more money, I always assumed that part of my income wasn't mine. Just like I assume my taxes, that percentage of my income isn't mine. It's the government's. And so I would always assume that part of my income isn't mine, it's for future me. So I'm going to put that into savings and then that compounds and compounds. And by the time I get to 65 or 55 or whatever it is, then I should have enough there where I can take care of myself. What do entrepreneurs and small business owners need to do now to find clients and get business, whatever they're doing, you know, whether they're a product designer looking to design products for other people as, as independents, what, what is the space that people can get out there? Because you mentioned your, um, relationships, you know, years ago with these amazing women that are doing amazing things now. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said earlier, you know, that email from 2013, my goodness, it was all because of <laughs> Diane, like Diane Laporte, um, or Di Danielle, Danielle Laporte rather. Yes. Um, so what, what can, what can we do to find clients in this age of automation, social media, imagery, messaging, people that, you know, like you, Paul, um, maybe don't want to be in this, in the like speed zone all the time, but they can't help it. How yeah. do, how do we do this? How do we find a client? How do we get business? Yeah. I think that whatever industry you're in, most of the people aren't going to do what they say they're going to do. So if you do that you are standing out immediately. And when I first started business, I was like, it can't be this easy. Like it can't just <laughs> be, thinking, what? it can't just be somebody <laughs> hires me and gives me money. And then I do the work for the budget and in the time frame that they told me to. And they're shocked. And I'm like, it can't be this easy. And most of the time it was people because I was doing web design. Most people would tell me, you're the first web designer that I hired that did the work in the time frame that, they told me it was going to take. And I was like, really? So I think that's a big thing. Like if everything you say is a social contract with the other person, right? So like if your word is good, then word is going to get around. I think the other thing is that 
if I was trying to market to the internet, I don't know how to market to the internet. The internet is too big, but I know how to reach a small group of people and people talk. So if there's a conference, it's just like, it's not even me that had this story. My buddy, Justin Jackson was like, there's this, a, a guy that he knows who is a developer who's like, I want to make um, software. I want to make websites for realtors for real estate. And Justin was like, well, do you know any realtors? And he was like, no. He was like, do you, have you been to any real estate conferences? He's like, no. He's like, what do you know about the real estate industry? He's like, I don't know. I bought a house once. Like I, I want to work with them. And he's like, if you're not doing any of those things, like what is the likelihood that you can talk to people that need the type of work that you provide, right? Like what conferences can you go to? What networking events can you go to? Who do you know in your own network? I think that all business is pretty much networking. Mm -hmm. And I think the people that have been in business long enough know that relationships are so important. Like when people ask me like, how did you get to work with like Microsoft or Mercedes? It's like, I didn't just go knock on the door at their head office and be like, hey, do you need a web designer? I knew somebody that worked there and it made it easy because otherwise it would be very, very hard. So what can you do to, to build your now? I mean, like I'm introverted. I'm socially awkward. I don't care. I still want to get to know other people and not because I want to extract something out of them later, but just because people are interesting. Mm. And so if you get to know people, like all of the business opportunities that I've had in 20 years have been because I have gotten to know other people. Wow, this is amazing it's great. conversation. This is the best. Thank you so much for sharing yeah, with us and spending much. time with us. Astonishing, astonishing. Just thank you. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Thanks. I'm Esther. I'm Ginger. I'm Paul. And this is The Honest Field Guide. We'll talk to you next time. The Honest Field Guide podcast is produced by Burke Creative, written and created by Ginger Birkenbuehl and Esther Coro. The podcast is recorded in the innovation and technology capital of the Midwest, Chicago, at Stomping Ground Studios in Ukrainian Village. Original music is written by and provided courtesy of Utah Carroll. Follow Honest Field Guide on Instagram and Twitter. The opinions expressed on the Honest Field Guide are opinions only and only represent the views of Ginger Birkenbuehl and Esther Coro. E.